Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfect Snatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our microbiology and infectious diseases playlist. In the previous videos, we talked about Listeria, Diphtheria, and an introduction to Clostridia. Today, we'll start by the first Clostridium, which is Clostridium tetani, the gram-positive rod that causes tetanus with the classic spasms. We're talking lock jaw or trismus, we are talking rhesus sardonicus or the sardonic smile. We're talking hyperextension of the back or opis thotinus. With that said, now let's get started. But before we get started, right off the bat, let's get this out of the way. There is a huge difference between Clostridium tetani and Clostridium botulinum. Clostridium tetani produces a toxin. Clostridium botulinum also produces a toxin. The name is different. No one cares. But then the mechanism is also different. We do care about this. Clostridium tetani inhibits GABA, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. When you inhibit the inhibitory, you are excitatory. The negative of the negative is a positive. The loss of a loss is a gain. Gaining of what? Of spasticity. You get spastic paralysis. Your muscles are stiff and spasmodic. Contrast that with the botulinum toxin, which inhibits the acetylcholine release at the neuromuscular junction. Without acetylcholine, you will not contract. Therefore, you'll be flaccid paralysis. Too much contraction versus too little contraction. Pause and review. Please watch the videos in this playlist in order. Clostridium tetani is a gram-positive rod and spore-forming, strictly anaerobic, yet motile. Again, Clostridium tetani is a gram-positive rod, spore-forming, strictly anaerobic, yet motile, causes a disease known as tetanus. By inhibiting GABA, we cause spastic paralysis. Repetition is the mother of pedagogy. Clostridium tetani is a gram-positive bacillus, spore-forming, anaerobic, motile. Do they make endospores? Yes, Clostridium tetani do make endospores. Don't forget that we have lots of calcium in the structure of the spore, and the function of the spore is to protect the organism from heat, chemicals, enzymes, i.e. unfavorable conditions. What's the classic definition of Clostridia? Gram-positive, strictly anaerobic endospores and unable to reduce sulfate to sulfite. In the last video, we talked about the problems with the classic definition. Clostridia are everywhere around you. They are ubiquitous in water, sewage, and soil. They are part of your flora, especially in the gut, and mostly harmless. Saprophytes, what does that mean? Living on dead cells or dead plants. Why are Clostridia dangerous to humans? Because they make endospores, because they can grow even when oxygen is absent, and because they produce toxins. Can Clostridium tetani produce a toxin? Yes, it has two types of toxins, the most famous of which is tetanospasmin. Does Clostridium tetani make a spore? Absolutely yes. Clostridium tetani, abundant, ubiquitous, in soil, water, and sewage system. It colonizes your gut. Strictly anaerobe, extremely sensitive to oxygen. In other words, oxygen will kill Clostridium tetani, and that's why it's very difficult to culture. Because if your sample just smelled one tiny molecule of oxygen, it's ruined. It's not gonna grow. And you will say, oh, uh, there was no Clostridium tetani in the sample. Shut up. There was Clostridium tetani in your sample, you just killed it. Given the fact that it's difficult to grow and it's difficult to culture Clostridium tetani, when it grows on your culture, it grows as a very thin film on the surface, not as discrete, robust colonies. Clostridium tetani can make a spore, absolutely. The spores are round and terminal, giving it the classic drumstick appearance. We call this the drumstick spore. If I ever open a restaurant, this will be the name. Drumstick spores. Come to us. We will add some rusty nails to your food. This is what we call customer service. This was the story of the spore. Tell me about the toxins. We have two types of toxins released by Clostridium tetani. The first is oxygen labile hemolysin. The second is heat labile neurotoxin. Tell me more about the oxygen labile hemolysin. It's called tetanolysin. It's another hemolysin. Oh, just like the hemolysin of streptococcus, known as streptolysin? Exactly. Just similar to the hemolysin released by Listeria and Clostridium perfringens? Absolutely. They are serologically related. All of them are very similar. Hey, Medicosis, what's the clinical significance of this tetanolysin? No one knows. Why is this Medicosis? 
because once it enters into your body, it gets destroyed and inhibited by your oxygen and your serum cholesterol. Ah, oh, so once it enters, it gets destroyed and inhibited, and therefore we cannot clinically study its function. Contrast that with the heath labile neurotoxin known as tetanospasmin, which we do understand its function and mechanism. Let's go. It's a classic exotoxin, i.e. AB toxin. We have an A subunit and a B subunit. Each one is a polypeptide. We link them together via disulfide bond. In the beginning, they are present as one unit, and then we can cleave it and break it down into two subunits. How do you break down proteins and peptides? By a protease. Oh, that makes sense. Let's cleave it into the light A chain and the heavy B chain. A stands for active or enzymatic activity or catalytic activity. This is very toxic. But B is for binding with your cell receptor, which happen to be on your motor neurons. That's why you will suffer motor symptoms, such as spasticity all over the place, in your jaw, in your smile, hyperextension of your back, in your facial muscles, etc., etc., etc. Tell me more, Medicosis. In this B subunit, it has N-terminus and a carboxyl terminus, just like any polypeptide. Oh, I remember that. I remember the N-terminus and the carboxyl terminus. Look at the carboxyl terminus. Look at it and respect it, because this carboxyl terminus, the COOH, is going to bind your sialic acid receptor, known as polysialogangliosides, and it's also going to bind your glycoproteins on your motor neurons, especially on the axon of your motor neurons. So let's recap. A is active, A is enzymatic activity and catalytic activity. What's the name of the enzyme there? Zinc endopeptidase or a zinc metalloprotease. Ace means an enzyme. Protease is an enzyme that breaks down proteins. Peptidase, same thing, an enzyme that breaks down polypeptides or peptides, same concept. Endo means endogenous. Zinc means it requires zinc in order to work. That's why it's a metalloprotease, because zinc is a freaking metal in the periodic table. Did anyone have a chemistry class before? Put differently, zinc endopeptidase is the same as zinc metalloprotease. And this is the function of the A subunit of the toxin. What's the function of the B subunit then? It's a carbohydrate binding protein. It binds to your carbohydrate on your cell surfaces. Go back and study physiology and you will realize that your cell membrane was lipid bilayer plus protein plus carbohydrates. Tell me more about the pathophysiology of tetanospasmin. It's the freaking toxin or exotoxin of Clostridium tetany. First, it's an AB toxin. And then when you cleave it, look at the B toxin and respect it because it has a COOH terminus or the C terminus. B is for binding. It's going to bind your sialic acid receptor known as polysialogangliosides and it's going to bind your glycoproteins. Once it binds your glycoproteins on the axon of your motor neurons, it will be internalized in an endosome inside the neuron inside the axon of the neuron to be exact and after this it will travel backwards upwards towards your soma in a retrograde axonal transport fashion and then it will reach the soma of your motor neurons inside the soma the soma is very active the soma has metabolism metabolism releases acids such as pyruvic acid lactic acid phosphoric acid sulfuric acid uric acid you name it it releases acids therefore the endosome once it reaches your soma is going to be acidified oh it's gonna change of course it will. Conformational change. Now the light A chain, the active part of the toxin, will pass from the membrane of your neuron into the cytosol, into the inside of the neuron itself. And then it will start to act using its enzymatic activity, i.e. zinc metalloprotease, i.e. zinc endopeptidase, to do what? To break down proteins. What kind of proteins? Snare proteins. What the flip were these? Snare proteins are responsible for transmission and more importantly, release of neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. 
not to be confused with your intergluteal cleft. One is physiology, the other is anatomy. Big difference. Once the toxins zinc metalloprotease starts to degrade my snare proteins, I will not be able to release GABA into the synaptic cleft. When I cannot release GABA, i.e., when I cannot release the inhibitory neurotransmitter, what do you think I'll get? Excitation. The negative of the negative is positive. The inhibition of the inhibitor is an excitation. Too much spasticity all over the place. In my jaw, trismus. In my face, the classic sardonic smile, rhesus sardonicus, and hyperextension of my back known as opistotonus. And this is why tetanospasmin is so toxic because it inhibits and degrades my snare proteins, rendering me unable to release my inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. Please beware that tetanospasmin, when it binds snare, is an irreversible binding. There is no going back. Hey, medicosis, will I recover from tetanus? It depends. If you are able to make brand new axon knobs or axon terminalis, you will recover. Why? Because the new axonal terminal knobs that you will make will contain new snare proteins that have never seen the ugly tetanospasmin. If you can regenerate them, you will recover. But based on your old snares that were destroyed by tetanospasmin, it was an irreversible destruction. In other words, in order to recover, you need to make new terminal axon knobs, which are these doozies right here. Does anyone remember my previous video on bacillus anthracis, which causes anthrax? We talked about its protective antigen, and the protective antigen had what? Zinc metalloprotease. And this is how anthrax was able to cause cell death. That's why we call it lethal toxin. And does anyone remember my previous video on diphtheria? How did the diphtheria toxin, which is an exotoxin, work? It was a classic AB toxin. Polypeptide, polypeptide, bound together by a disulfide bond. A is for active, it has the enzymatic activity or catalytic activity. That's why we call it the catalytic region. But the B subunit was for binding to your cell receptor and the classic endosome. And the B is to facilitate the entry of the A to your cell. And A will cause every kind of enzymatic destruction. What did we call the B? Receptor binding region. Oh, but who caused the actual destruction? A, because it's active, enzymatic activity. Active to do what? To inhibit your elongation factor so that you cannot elongate your peptide chain during protein synthesis. You are unable to make proteins and without proteins you are toast. Quiz time! Can a non-toxigenic strain of Clostridium tetany just decide to change and convert into a toxigenic strain of Clostridium tetany? Yes or no? Why or why not? Let me know the answer in the comment section. You will find the answer key in the next video in this glorious playlist known as Microbiology and Infectious Diseases. Some pearls for the pros. Tetanus causes spastic paralysis. How come? Because it inhibits the inhibitory neurotransmitter. You cannot release GABA thanks to the degradation of the snare proteins, thanks to my zinc metalloprotease activity, which is in the A subunit of the tetanospasmin exotoxin. But how about the next Clostridium, Clostridium botulinum? It causes flaccid paralysis, descending flaccid paralysis to be exact. How come? By decreasing the release of acetylcholine, and therefore, there is no muscle contraction, therefore, I get flaccid paralysis. Can this kill me? Absolutely, from respiratory paralysis. How did rabies virus work? Well, let me tell you something. The receptor for rabies virus is your acetylcholine receptor at the motor end plate or neuromuscular junction. Therefore, acetylcholine will not be able to bind its receptor on the motor end plate, and therefore your muscles will not contract, you get flaccid paralysis. Yes, in the beginning it is spasms, but then it becomes flaccid paralysis. Just like your depolarizing neuromuscular blockers, in the beginning there is activation, but at the end there is inhibition and paralysis. Pay attention, botulism causes descending flaccid paralysis, 
Contrast that with Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a peripheral demyelination, where the flaccid paralysis is ascending. Big difference. What's the most common cause of mortality? Same thing, respiratory paralysis. Hemidicosis is my diaphragm considered to be skeletal muscle or smooth muscle? Skeletal muscle. Does it have uh, nicotinic receptors or muscarinic receptors? Nicotinic receptors. Oh, now it makes sense. Let's review Clostridium tetany from the wonderful website Picmonic. Clostridium tetany, here is Titanic. Is a gram positive, here is my angel. Rod, here is the rod. Obligate anaerobe, here is the ant anaerobe. It releases an exotoxin. Here's the toxin coming out of the cell or of the balloon. It can make spores. Here are the spores. Tetanospasmin will inhibit the Renshaw cell in your spinal cord. What the flip is the Renshaw cell? It's an inhibitory interneuron in your spinal cord that synapses with alpha motor neuron. When you inhibit the inhibitory, you are excitatory. How did it inhibit the Renshaw cell? By inhibiting the release of GABA, by inhibiting and cleaving your snare proteins. Inhibiting the inhibition will lead to spasms. Too much spasms. Here is a spasm spaceship. Including Rhesus sardonicus. Here's the sardine. The classic sardonic smile. Lock jaw or trismus and arching and hyperextension of the back known as opisthotonus. If you like this video, you will enjoy my antibiotics course, which will equip you with a robust knowledge about antibacterials, antivirals, antifungals, and antiparasitic medications. Download it today at medicosisperfectionatus.com. I also have a cardiac pharmacology course to teach you about the antiarrhythmics, antianginal, antihyperlipidemics, antihypertensives, and even diuretics and digoxin. Plus, a neuropharmacology course with the antiepileptics, antidepressants, antipsychotics antipsychotics, anti-Parkinsonians, opiates, anesthetics, stimulants, sedatives, and hypnotics. Download all of them at medicosisperfectionatus.com. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Go to Picmonic for some doozy animated pictured mnemonics. Thanks for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense.